Let us continue to praise God by affirming our faith. The Old Testament reading is from Job, chapters 1 and 2. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all people in the East. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Whence have you come? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for naught? Haven't you put a hedge about him and his house? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to his face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were feasting. A messenger came to Job, saying, Sabians fell upon the oxen and took them, and slew the servants. I alone have escaped to tell you. When he was yet speaking, there came another who said, Fire fa fell from heaven and burned the sheep and servants. I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another who said, The Chalde Chaldeans made a raid upon the camels and took them. And while he was yet speaking, there came another who said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. A great wind came and struck the house and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and rent his robe and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord ta has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this God did not sin or charge God with wrong. Then Satan afflicted Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this Job did not sin with his lips. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Such a uh, cheerful reading, Dale. Thank you <laughs> for that. We're beginning a, uh, following the lectionary, a three-week series of sermons on the book of Job. Uh, I don't usually title sermons, but this one has a title. And the title is, Everything Happens for a Reason. And this is so very true, and it's so very false, and it's so very true. 
Let's think about that. If we were having one of those uh, games where uh, you know contestants or guests, uh, audience reactions to something, if you had to say, what was the number one audience adjective that they would attach to the name of Job? People would say, patient. They have the patience of Job. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? The image of this is that Job is fabulously wealthy, but he's also fabulously pious. He's a little bit like Jesus' rich young ruler, right? He's a holy man. He's prospered. He seemed blessed in every way. And then he loses all of it and violently, all of his possessions, ten of his children, to lose one child. It's unspeakably horrible. Job loses ten. And then he's afflicted with boils, horrible health himself. But according to the story, after all of that, Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord. This reminds me when I was ten years old, uh, my birthday's in the fall, uh, boys playing football. I didn't have a football. I put out word to my parents. I really hoped I would get a football for my birthday. Uh, I found a wrapped present in the house, and my mother said, well, that's your birthday present. You got to wait to your birthday. And it was a box about this size. I thought, yeah, football's great. And the day of my birthday came, and we cut cake and blew out the candles, and I tore open the present. And my, my mother had bronzed my baby shoes. inexplicably. And inside, you know, I wanted to say, this is the stupidest gift. I wanted a football. What? But, but no, no, no. I was well trained. And I went to my mother and I said, thank you so much for this wonderful birthday gift of bronze baby shoes. <laughs> Job, he suffers horrors and he, blessed be the name of the Lord. I think the book is setting out to correct that kind of dumb notion. Now, the story takes place in the land of Uz. That's not even in Israel. It's not in the promised land. It's in a foreign place. And Job is not even an Israelite. He's not one of the chosen people, and his friends aren't either. This is interesting. It's like foreigners in a foreign place. And God looks down at Job, and he brags. Is God a braggart, right? And he brags, like, oh, have you seen anyone like Job? And he's a foreigner. I'm like, what's that about? Uh, I thought about this the last weekend. Uh, I preached up in uh, Baltimore. And uh, when Lisa and I got to Baltimore, we did what all people do, right? We went to visit a cemetery. This is what you do when you're touring, right? You go to a cemetery. <laughs> we went to the Mount Olivet Cemetery in Baltimore where a lot of famous Methodists are buried. And I like to read the tombstones. One is a guy named Robert Strawbridge. His tombstone says this. Robert Strawbridge, the first Methodist local preacher in Maryland, and also his excellent wife unnamed. <laughs> Job had a wife, also unnamed, not so excellent, I think. Next to Robert Strawbridge are interred the ashes of E. Stanley Jones. E. Stanley Jones, famous Methodist evangelist of the 20th century, traveled all over the world trying to convert people to Christ. The person he was most impressed by on planet Earth was not a Christian. It was Mahatma Gandhi. He spent a lot of time in India became a great friend of Gandhi, and he wrote about Gandhi and said, why aren't the Christians like Gandhi? He's more Christian than the Christians. Christians should look at Gandhi and be either inspired or ashamed. Is, is Job like Gandhi? God looks down and says, oh, look at Job. Uh, the God in this whole story is, is kind of small-minded. We have to get our minds around this. This is during the Persian Empire. The Persian emperors in those days, they had henchmen all over the empire. They were called the eyes and ears of the king. They're sort of like spies trolling around so they could unearth any subversion before it got out of control. Uh, God in Job is pictured as having this, and, and one of his spies, one of his eyes and ears is this, the Satan. It's not the red guy with the pitchfork commanding heaven. It's one of God's spies. And then God brags to the spy about how great Job is, and the spy responds with a really good question. He asks God, does Job serve God for nothing? Does Job serve God for nothing? And Job's all holy and pious, but then he's been so blessed. He's got so much stuff, and his life is so easy and comfortable, and Job is just a challenge to God. Like, you know, Make him suffer some. He'll give up on you. It raises the question of, you know, why do we get invested with God? You know, it's because of the, the blessings that you're supposed to get out of it. I think we think that often. It's kind of a deal. If I pray, go to church, whatever, God will respond with protection, goodness, prosperity, something. That's why people doubt God when things don't go. So, well, it reminds me of a uh, college student when I was in Davidson. We had a lot of college students from Davidson came to the church, and 
There was a young man, he was wicked smart. He became the valedictorian of his class. He came to church, but he always would explain to me on the way out, he'd say, I don't believe in God, I will never believe in God. But he kept coming to church. It's pretty interesting. One Sunday after church, he said, I'd like to talk to you. Okay, so we sat down and he said, "Uh, I think I want to become a Christian. And I said, great. He said, but I have one question. I said, what is it? He said, "Uh, can you be a Christian and not believe in eternal life? I didn't know the answer to this question. But I said, yes, of course. It was my first convert, right? I was excited. (laughs) I didn't want to lose him on a technicality. (laughs) And so I said, you know, why do you ask this question? And I love what he said to me. He said, well, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I don't want to do it because I might get some reward out of it or I might avoid something negative if I do that. I want to follow Jesus just because it's good and pure and right and true. I said, yeah, you can be... (laughs) You can be a Christian. I don't hear that kind of thing very much. I said, but I have a question for you. He said, what is it? I said, well, you know, you don't believe in eternal life, but one day when you die, if God surprises you with eternal life, would that be okay? He said, oh, yeah, I'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Does Job serve God for naught? Do any of us serve God for nothing? This God, it's not the true God, right? The God of the book of Job, God's not like that. We know God's not like that. This is a sophomoric God. He's like those gods in the Greek pantheon. You know, they're arguing with each other, and they inflict their troubles on the people of the world. God's moody. God's capricious. He makes a wager with his spy and says, oh, okay, go ahead and harm him. We'll see what happens. Like, we know God isn't like that. The big thing in church is figuring out what God isn't like. Sometimes it's like, you know, I love the scene in The Wizard of Oz, right, where Dorothy and her friends finally get to Oz, and they come in, and they're trembling before the great wizard of Oz. But then Toto, the little dog, right, goes and pulls the curtain back. It turns out there's not this great wizard of Oz. It's just like a little guy pushing buttons back there. Sometimes we say everything happens for a reason, and, the, and I think what we're I think what we're thinking is, like, we can't understand why God would do this. If we could pull back the curtain, then God could explain these terrible things. Why? Why? Why why does my brother have cancer? Why does my mother have Alzheimer's? Why did my marriage fail? Why? And why there's there's a reason behind the the curtain. The fact is, Job's trying to teach us is that God is not this great inflictor. God is not the great smiter. God's not up in heaven ready to hit the smite button and says, I'm gonna smite, I'm gonna smite Alan. I'm gonna bless Susan but I'm going to smite Sharon, but I'm going to bless Ken. And we get this thing going, and this is not, this is not God. We, we know that this is not God. You see, God's not stuck rewarding the righteous and punishing the wicked. And we know it doesn't happen that way anyhow. Every one of us in this room has known somebody who was very, very good and holy and wonderful and prayerful, and they've suffered terribly. And we've all known people who were total dishonest nincompoops who've done really well. They're healthy, and everything seems to go great for them. They live to be 97, and they die in their sleep. That's how it is. Job is ridiculously pious. His horrors happen to him. He loses everything and violently. He loses not one but ten Children, he is afflicted with boils all over his skin, and he just scrapes himself. But in the story, at least in the beginning, he says, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. He's holier than Jesus, right? Because when Jesus is suffering on the cross, Jesus will say, oh, Lord, thank you for the suffering that you have brought to me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus is on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the book of Job, by the time we get to the end of it, is going to invite us to pray like that. Instead of like this fake, pious Job that we see at the beginning of the story. This whole thing about um, health stuff. I have a friend who teaches at Duke Divinity School named Kate Bowler. Uh, Kate actually wrote a book called Everything Happens for a Reason. Her whole book is about debunking this nonsense that we say to people when they're suffering. Kate knows what she's talking about. Uh, When she was 35 years old, a young mom, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. She's hanging in there. She's still doing okay. 
But she suffered a lot, and one of the things that she suffered were just the dumb things that people said to her, and one of the things that a dumb person said to her was this. Someone said to her, I hope you have a Job experience. Like, seriously? You shouldn't wish a Job experience on anybody. You shouldn't wish a Job experience on the most evil person that's ever lived on planet Earth. I think what the person was trying to say is that there seems to be, we have this fiction, right, is that, is that Job suffers, but then he learns from his suffering, and then everything's cool. It, we kind of want to do that. We do this with people, right? Oh, you're suffering, but God's teaching you some kind of lesson. The one and only time I've ever walked out of church before it was over, and believe me, I have sat through a lot of awful church services. I have even made my contributions to that being <laughs> the case. The one and only time I ever walked out of church, when I was in seminary, I was driving, I was traveling one Sunday morning, and it was about 11 o'clock, and I thought, oh, I better go to church. That's what you're supposed to do, by the way. And I'm driving along, this is Methodist Church. I think, well, I'll go here. And I went there, but then I had to leave because the pastor was talking, and I'm trying to size up what had happened. And evidently, there was a young mom in the congregation who had died suddenly, and the husband, who had not been a churchgoer, had come back to church. And he was in the church, and the pastor was saying, God took her so that he would come to believe in me. I just walked out of there. God doesn't kill people. God doesn't harm people. God's not your enemy, ever. Everything happens for a reason. And that's the truest thing I've ever said to you. And a lot of times we just have to use our brains, not thinking that it's behind some curtain that needs to be pulled out, but everything happens for a reason that you can perfectly well understand. We've been tracking a young man named Jaden Olson, 17 years old, a patient at Levine Children's Hospital. During uh, Hurricane Florence, uh, he was trying to help somebody and a huge limb fell on his head and he suffered a terrible skull fracture. We didn't think he would survive the first 24 hours, but he's still with us. And uh, you'll be very clear, God didn't look down and say, I'm gonna drop a big limb on Jaden's head, and then I'm going to protect these other people. We do this in storms, don't we? We're like, I didn't lose electricity, God protected me. Don't do that. Don't do that. God did not smite Jaden. The reason that happened is that it's dangerous to be out when there's a hurricane. And what happens with trees is they get some age over time, and then it's rained a lot, and there's wind, and limbs fall. And if you're out there, one might fall on your head. That's it. Everything. That's the reason that that happens. I've been preaching today, looking out, and I've seen people who have cancer or have loved and lost someone with cancer, or they have someone they love who's maybe even in their 20s with cancer. Sometimes people say, why did God give him that cancer? We'll say, oh, God protected me from... Everything happens for a reason. The reason isn't God gives people cancer and protects other people from cancer. Everything happens for a reason. People get cancer because of genetic stuff. There's some environmental things that we know something about. Things happen for a reason. We have division in our country. That's something that afflicts every one of us, right? It's not like God looked down and said, you Americans shall be divided against one another and be filled with loathing for half the population. <laughs> this is not something God's done. God didn't make it where half the people would be brilliant and the other half of the people in America would be utterly stupid. What happened is you got raised a certain way and you have certain fears and certain experiences and that's why you think what you think politically, and then there's division. A lot of stuff happens all the time. Somebody acts out at work, or maybe you're a little bit, you know, something happens with you, and it, it's, it's puzzling. We have a program tomorrow night that you really ought to come to. I know sometimes you ignore me on this, but don't. Tomorrow night we have a program on adverse childhood experiences, and what we think is, you know, that's abuse or something terrible, but actually every one of us have adverse childhood experiences, and it, and it sticks with you forever. Some little trigger happens, and then you act out at work, you get depressed, you can't get out of bed, something happens, and it's because of something that happened to you. In childhood, maybe you had a harsh word with someone or you, you failed at something that you dreamed of succeeding at or you're scorned lover or whatever. Something happens and it's traumatic for you and then it, it lives with you the rest of your life. And things happen for a reason, you see. And if you think about the reason, then instead of saying to somebody, what's wrong with you? We can say, what happened to you? 
Instead of saying, what's wrong with me? That's what happened to me. Everything happens for a reason. God is not your enemy. God does not harm you or anybody else ever. God is all mercy. God is all compassion. We're fragile. We're fragile. God doesn't weave some bubble of protection around us. We're vulnerable down here. God knows it. He sent his own son down, became really vulnerable, was killed at age 30. That's how it is in this life. God's not our enemy. And ours is to be the body of Christ. Ours is to love. It is never ours to paste some stupid saying that we think is about God and might help somebody like, everything happens for a reason, and oh, you're supposed to thank God for your misery. Not what God wants from us. God welcomes our cries, our sorrows. God asks us to love, lift one another up. It's hard down here. God always loves us. Thanks be to God.